it's seven o'clock. We are starting. My name is Dr. Julia Budnik and I'm one of the co-directors of SDS seminars. And we've been doing this SDS free Thursdays since the beginning of the very first lockdown. Can't, difficult to believe that we're counting lockdowns now. It's the third one we are in. So we started in March in the beginning of the first lockdown and we used to do them weekly and now we're doing them fortnightly. And it's really, really nice to see that new people are coming, new people are discovering these events and coming to see us and to be with, with your colleagues. That's really nice. Today we have a very special event because uh, we have a speaker who is really a towering figure in the field of working with anger. And we've done several events like that on working with anger and um, Paul Grantham presented on anger and usually they produce lots and lots of questions. So we expect that there will be questions for our guest today. So what you can do, you can put your questions in the chat box at the time when you think of the question. And I will be copying questions and then asking them at the end. So we will not be probably having an open floor because we have lots of people, 165 at the moment, and I know that 500 people uh, registered for this event. So Professor Di Giuseppe agreed to come to our Thursday because he's doing a one day masterclass for SDS seminars in March. And before I pass the microphone to Paul to introduce our guest um, properly, I want to show you on our website where you can find this information about this course. So please tell me if you can see SDS website, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the course is very easy to find because I've made it a featured course on SDS front page. So you go on our homepage skillsdevelopment.co.uk and you scroll down to featured course and that will be the masterclass with Professor Raymond Di Giuseppe. Okay, and furthermore, at the moment, this course is on special offer on a super early bird discount and I've extended it until the end of January because I appreciate that lots of people wanted to come today to this Thursday and make their decision whether they want to come to the full day event. So you have few more days after today to make that decision and to take the advantage of the super early bird discount. So it's right on top of special offers and it is uh, with a super early bird discount. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, pass the microphone to Paul, my co-director, Paul Grantham, who will introduce our speaker properly. Paul. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Julia. Um, this for me is a very special event. Um, Ray, in my opinion, is currently and has been for a number of decades, the voice on evidence-based psychotherapy with regards to anger problems. Um, he is currently head of the Department of Psychology at St. John's University in uh, New York State in the USA. And he's on a number of editorial boards of the Journal of Rational Emotive and Cognitive Behavioral Therapies and Cognitive and Behavioral Practice and Journal of Cognitive Psychotherapies, uh, which is a quarterly. He has been in the past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and he's also director of professional education at the Albert Ellis Institute in New York. In terms of his publications, they're really too long to, um, to actually mention, but what I will actually say, he is specifically known for having developed two specific anger assessment tools that are very commonly used uh, within the clinical field, the anger disorder scale for adults and the anger regulation and expression scale for children and adolescents. He has been working at my estimate, and please forgive me if I get this wrong, Ray, for 45 years with clients with anger problems and uh, has received numerous awards and honorariums. Uh, he has four children and 
to my up-to-date knowledge, two grandchildren. Um, and uh, we are just very, very pleased to have him here. And I'm certainly looking forward to this, as well as obviously uh, the event that's going to be occurring in March as well. Um, I don't want to give up any more of your time, Ray. I'd like to hand this over to you and just simply say thanks very much for coming. Enormously welcome. And uh, the floor is yours, really. Okay. Thank you. All right. It's a pleasure to be here and have so many people and uh, wish I could be there in person and that we could all uh, chat. But, uh, you know, viruses get in the way and uh, we certainly can get, get angry at the viruses, but it's not going to do us very much good. So um, I work almost exclusively with uh, angry people these days and probably for about the past 25 years, I've done uh, some work with just excluding myself to angry people. And I, I got interested working with anger in an interesting way. When I got out of graduate school and I started a private practice, um, I realized that there was a population of people that nobody wanted to see. And that was usually angry adolescents, you know, that, and, and I realized that people would spend more money on treating their children than they would themselves. So I decided that for financial reasons, I guess, to take on this group that nobody wanted. And um, I realized that there was very little discussion about the emotions that the kids would feel. If you look at the diagnostic criteria for oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder that most of those kids would have met when I started doing this, uh, any emotion was really not identified at all as being rather important. And um, anger was really not identified. And that has been the case all along. And actually the, the idea that anger is not a diagnos diagnosable condition, either in the DSM or the ICD, the, um, I guess it's 10 or 11 now, as was the catalyst to put me into doing anger in the research area. And so about, uh, about 20, 25 years ago, I had uh, the Albert Ellis Institute where I was seeing clients and still do work clinically. Um, we had been doing a lot of work with PTSD clients who were victims of crime or victims of domestic violence. And the agency, one of the agencies from the city that referred to us said, you know, um, we send you these victims, are you willing to deal with the perpetrators? Are you dealing to really deal with the angry people? And nobody wanted to deal with them. And I thought that treating the victims of domestic violence and not the perpetrators was a very good business model because there'd always be new victims. The only way to stop victims was really to treat the perpetrators. That was the best thing we could do for them. And so we started to say, yeah, we'll take these people and the postdoctoral fellows and interns that I was supervising decided that we would take all these angry cases that came in. And after just about a couple of months, one of uh, my uh, trainees, uh, Chris Eckhart, who now does domestic violence research out at uh, Purdue University, um, said to me uh, that the, the front desk is on my case because I need a diagnosis. You know, I need a diagnosis for these people and they really don't meet any diagnosis. And I said, what do you mean they don't meet any diagnosis? And he said, well, the best diagnosis that fits is intermittent explosive disorder, but that's intermittent. So if you beat your wife once in a while, you know, uh, you meet the criteria. If you do it regularly, then you don't meet the criteria. So, because it's gotta be impulsive. And so we really got interested in this whole issue of whether or not we had a diagnosable condition to treat anger. And uh, presently there still is in DSM-5, no anger disorder. To me, this seemed rather odd because um, I've always, I guess, through my affiliation with Albert Ellis and reading of the Stoic philosophy, which is the foundation of REBT and CBT, realized that anger was a disorder that all ancient philosophers addressed. It was one of the primary causes of human disturbance that they all spoke about. But somewhere around uh, 1900, anger really was no longer considered a form of psychopathology. Um, and the, you know, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, the Roman philosopher, all wrote extensively about um, anger and all identified it as a form of pathology. As a matter of fact, 
Uh, Seneca used to call anger bravest furor, which was the Latin phrase meaning temporary or brief madness. So how did we go from having anger recognized as a really key component of human suffering and disturbance to having it missing from our um, diagnostic manual, whatever you want to talk about it. So that was one of the first things we started to deal with is what, why is it that we don't have anger? And, and I'll say a couple of things about that. As a college professor, I can tell you that if you wanted to teach a course in psychology at any, any type of course, so abnormal psychology, clinical psychology, introduction to psychology, anger is barely mentioned it almost doesn't appear in textbooks in abnormal psychology. So what is it that we don't discuss anger? You know, why is it not there? Um, it is, in terms of assessment instruments, there are many fewer assessment instruments for anger than there are for the alternative emotional disorders, uh, such as anxiety or depression, okay? Um, so, we don't have it. And the other interesting thing is that the assessment instruments on anger really can't agree on what the characteristics are about anger that should be assessed. Um, one of my dissertation students did a study where we looked at what were the characteristics of anger that were studied or mentioned as items or subtests in any of the anger disorders. And they were very different. They did not agree and they were not very comprehensive. So as a result, a lot of anger scales don't correlate very highly with each other because they don't agree on what the characteristics are and they don't include the same items. And so we really have a, a very big assessment issue. Um, and then we went along and we started to do a look at the treatment issues for anger and uh, what are some of the treatments that we have. And what we realized is that there are many fewer studies looking at effective interventions for anger than there are for other major diagnostic conditions. So that's really kind of the thing that got us interested in that. Most of the interventions also for treating anger come from a cognitive behavioral framework. And while that may be good, and certainly as a, you know, a person who's been affiliated with CBT for many years, I think that that's uh, maybe obvious, but we don't know a lot of things. Maybe some psychodynamic ideas are important. Maybe some Rogerian beliefs are important and that we haven't had very adequate tests. So um, we then uh, proceeded to sort of uh, examine anger in a more systematic way. So let me tell you one of the things that I think is really important for looking at anger. And that is that anger really is a different emotion than anxiety and depression. And it's different in a lot of important ways. One of the things that I get maybe only a bit miffed and annoyed at now they're angry, is that many of my colleagues will develop treatment programs for anger and they'll take a manual that they've developed for anxiety. They'll take the same manual and they'll just change it to anger without adjusting the manual to look at what are the unique things about anger that make it different. So they will challenge the same cognitive distortions that Beck talks about as influencing um, depression and assume that they will influence anger. And they'll, they'll look at the same irrational beliefs that Ellis has identified for depression and anxiety and assume that they're going to be the things that you're going to target in anger. And so we did not develop an anger literature in clinical psychology. When I first started to do some anger work, and I sort of remember this uh, kind of explicitly because my son Thomas who is now 24 years old, um, when he was born, I was on sabbatical starting to write the book, Understanding Anger Disorders. And I would have these two big piles of articles, one written by psychologists and researchers in the psychology of emotions and one written by clinicians. And they were really very different. Clinicians were very much in favor or proposed that anger was a secondary emotion reacting to depression and anxiety. And um, whereas the psychology of emotions research group really saw it as really a basic emotion. 
So if we go back and look at the stronger theories in the psychology of emotions, we see that the ideas that came out of more of the clinical literature turned out not to be supported very much. So most of the emotion theorists see anger as a basic emotion, not as a secondary emotion. Whereas most clinicians building on the work of Freud and uh, Emil, uh, I wrote the psychiatry handbook of psychiatry, you know, uh, they all see anger as a secondary emotion, Emil Kraepelin. So um, anger is different. It doesn't really I, uh, fit and treating it like anxiety and depression is probably a mistake. Now, certainly we have some comorbidity that people have ang anxiety and, dep and depression along with their anger, but they're not the same thing. And one of the primary differences between anger and emotion and the other negative emotions is that anger is the only negative emotion that has an approach gradient. So if you go back to your early learning theory, we have avoidance gradients and approach gradients. And when you feel shame or depressed or anxious or fear about a stimuli, you wanna move away from it. But when you feel anger at something, you wanna move towards it. You wanna you know, get that person and, and show them, and shake some sense into them. So it has some very different characteristics. Also, if you look at you know, MRI studies, when people feel anger, it's identified on different parts of the brain to the other negative emotions. So you know, anxiety and depression and fear and shame, they're all in the right hemisphere. But joy is on the left hemisphere along with anger. So it ends up that when we look at the characteristics of anger, anger shares as many characteristics with joy as it does with anxiety and depression, so that it really is this hybrid. It is a um, negative emotion that differs from all other negative emotions. Now, I said earlier that one of the things that it differs on is that it has an approach gradient, which means that anger probably leads to more impulsive, quick action than would anxiety or, or depression. And I think that this has some real clinical implications. What I've tried to do is take each one of these differences and say, given this difference in what the characteristics of anger are, what would that mean for the way we treat it? Or, and so if you did so treat somebody with anxiety as you have. And so I'm socially anxious. I actually come to London and meet you and I'm sitting there and I want to go talk to people and say hello. I could be having these thoughts that they're not going to like me. They don't like my New York accent, you know, and I have all these negative thoughts. And I could challenge my negative thoughts and it might take me a little while to do it. But eventually as I do it, I still have time to challenge it and then go up and say, hey, hello there, uh, Terry, how are you doing? But with anger, I don't have that opportunity because once I have the thoughts that that person is being nasty to me, I take an action and that I really need to do some activities to get the person to rehearse their new alternative beliefs, their new behaviors before I put them into the situation where they're gonna confront their stimuli. Whereas in anxiety, we want them to approach the feared stimulus pretty quickly in treatment. Whereas in anger, we want to do that only after we have well-established a new behavior and a new set of thoughts in the session. Because if they act too quickly, eh, they do themselves harm. Whereas if I slow down and I don't go say hello to Paul because I'm afraid, if I take five minutes to challenge my beliefs and then get the courage to do so, it's reinforced. That doesn't happen with anger. Another really important issue, and um, I'll, I'll tell you one of the research topics that I'm doing now that may have some relevance to this issue is, I said earlier that lots of therapists sort of take their anxiety manuals and just put a uh, anger term on it, and they don't really look at what cognitions are different. And we are have doing this large study with about a thousand people to look at what are the cognitive behavior therapy constructs that are gonna predict anger the best? And we have some identified from Beck's cognitive um, distortions and some identified from Ellis's irrational beliefs and some others that have been talked about. And uh, the one that we find that is missing in most 
cognitive behavior therapy treatment manuals uh, for anger is what we call the negative consequences of anger or consequential thinking. For angry people, they don't think that their anger is dysfunctional. And as a result, they have a very spurious motivation to change their anger. And they justify their anger. That's another characteristic about anger. So it's pleasant. And as a matter of fact, if you ask people to evaluate the, an anger episode and whether or not they want to change it or not, it's pretty much that they don't want to change it. They don't want to change it as much as people who have joy don't want to change that. Whereas anxiety and depression and shame are way at the other end of the continuum. So angry people don't want to change. And that we, what we do is help them analyze whether or not the anger works for them. Probably similar to the therapeutic uh, model in CBT called social problem solving or this thing of consequential thinking. And we found that the idea, my anger doesn't work for me is really one of the best predictors of the degree of anger and anger pathology on our anger disorder scale. And we really advocate then that the first thing that we want to do in therapy is analyze with the client the agreement of the goals of therapy. They want to change other people. I want them to see, does their anger really help for them? As, as I like to say, angry people don't come for therapy. They come for supervision. They want to change the, ang the people in their lives that they're angry at. That's when they want your supervision on how to change those other people. And they don't see the change as being necessary to come from them. And that may be the first issue. Now, uh, my research team has been working on updating our meta-analytic review of anger. Um, and we've sort of published an article on a summary of some meta-analytic reviews. And pretty much what we can identify is that most people don't do much analysis of whether your anger works for you. Okay, is it, is it helpful? And uh, even though that might fit under the model of what we call, you know, um, uh, motivational interviewing, we kind of don't use motivational interviewing with angry people or really aggressive people for that matter. And we jump right in to try to challenge their irrational beliefs or cognitive distortions and teach them new behaviors when they may not necessarily want to do it. And therefore we're likely to have a pretty good disruption in the therapeutic alliance because they may not necessarily want to change. So what we're attempting to do is uh, look at the characteristics of anger and say, based on the ways that anger differs from depression and anxiety, what are some of the therapeutic strategies that we want to try differently? And uh, this whole idea of looking at their motivation for change and helping them see the fact that anger is dysfunction may be the first intervention. And uh, that's really not done very often. The, the other area that we're finding really predicts anger pretty much is an idea that has been around in the anger literature for children and youth, but hasn't migrated up to the interventions with adults, which is really kind of surprising. And that is a model or an idea that is called attributions for hostile intent, you know, or I come up with a reason that somebody did a behavior and the reason that they did it was out to screw me, you know? So in a way, angry people are somewhat egotistical. They tend to see things in relations to themselves. They tend to think that other people have acted in a way that's related to the angry person and that they have an intention to harm us. So if you're walking down a corridor in a building, let's say in a hotel or in your school or whatever, and you someone bumps into you, the angry person is likely to think the person did it on, on purpose. They were out to get me. Um, and so this is really a really difficult issue because they start out with a little paranoia, this kind of suspiciousness. People that Now, we don't really know when suspiciousness kind of leads over into paranoia. <laughs> Right? What's the line when it becomes sort of a psychotic paranoia? Nobody really knows that. But it really is important to address this attribution for hostile intent. 
and more important than some of the other irrational beliefs and cognitive distortions, because it has a much more you know, powerful statistical approach or effect on anger, clinical anger. So we want to challenge it. And one of the things that we found clinically is that it's very hard to change because if I have this belief, you know, that, you know, um, let's say Paul set up this uh, talk for me in the middle of the day so I don't have my lunch and he did it on purpose because he thinks I'm too fat and he's trying and he's trying to influence me and I have this sort of a little suspicious attribution for hostile intent. If I try to challenge the veracity of that thought, like, well, how do you know that that was Paul's intent? Oh, you're on his side, are you? <laughs> you know, so that you have this difficulty where the angry person uh, looks at your attempts to look at the empirical truth of their thoughts as a way of identifying you as siding with their enemy. And we're being a little bit more successful if we say, well, let's suppose you're right. Let's suppose that Paul really just thinks you're, you know, a chubby slob and wants to like disrupt your lunch. As unlikely as that may sound, I still believe it. Let's suppose that he did that. Could you like not let that bother you? Could you think that, you know, he's not so important to me? So we're realizing that the attribution for hostile intent really is pretty strong we realize that it's something that we have to address. And we're realizing that some of the cognitive strategies that address it may be better than others in terms of how we go about doing it. Um, we have sort of come across another cognitive uh, attitude that is very influential in um, anger which we're really struggling with and sort of how to challenge it because it really is kind of important. And it's really up until now been uh, very much missing in the cognitive behavioral assessment and treatment of anger problems. And we call this the code of honor, okay? And the code of honor is this idea that if you, you know, like somebody over there has their lights off and maybe they're not showing their face, you know, there's a big N over there on the screen and like, you know, they're not, they don't want to, they're showing me disrespect because they're not paying attention. They don't think that what I have to say is kind of related to attributions for hostile intent. And, and I think that I have to call them out and insult them so that other people will know that you can't mess with me. You can't embarrass me in public. I have to prove that I'm an honorable person. Um, this code of honor is a very, say, popular idea in the political science literature. So there's one historian, a political scientist, who argues that every war that's been fought in all recorded history, way back to the Hittites and the Egyptians, you know, thousands of years ago, has a literature around honor code. We have to show those Hittites that they can't mess with us. And that lots of anger has this idea as well. So we recently created a um, code of honor scale. Actually, there's a couple of researchers who've done this. We've kind of put all their items together and came up with the best. And we find that it has one of the strongest relationships to anger whatsoever, but it hasn't been in any of the cognitive behavioral treatment manuals. Now, um, we find that in addition to countries doing to this, uh, the literature focuses more on inner city youth doing it. You know, you expect like juvenile delinquents do that. You know, that kid in the gang across the city, if they come into my neighborhood and they don't, you know, show me respect, I got to stab them and show respect. Um, and the idea has been portrayed in the literature that this is a low socioeconomic adolescent minority attitude. And in our researcher, we find that it's not necessarily the case. People making over $100,000 a year probably endorse the honor code more than the poorer people and the older people, the adults do it more than the adolescents and people do it to their spouses. Like, you know, if my spouse and my partner isn't going to do the dishes and leave dirty dishes for me and he or she is showing me disrespect, I have to say something because I can't have them disrespect me because then other people in the family will think they can disrespect me. And so we've been developing sort of strategies to work on um, looking at this new uh, 
uh, newer concept of code of honor um, and including it in a clinical assessment strategy. It's, it's very difficult because once again, the problem with challenging the code of honor is every once in a while, some belief that we think of as a cognitive distortion or irrational belief has a function. And there might be certain environments. Uh, we've just gotten a whole bunch of data that we collected from one of the federal prisons in California on this with a forensic psychologist, a prison psychologist that, that we know. And uh, you know, if you're in the prison and some people try to disrespect you, maybe it's a pretty good idea to uh, you know, fight back really quickly because other inmates may kind of target you because they think you're an easy pushover. Um, whereas if you do that to your children and your spouse, it's probably not such a healthy idea. So what we're finding is the context uh, of this honor code is really important to consider when we try to challenge it. So um, that's one of the, the other areas Honor code doesn't show itself too often in anxiety and um, depression. It's not the kind of cognition that usually um, shows itself, okay? So I, I guess I would say one of the things that we have attempted to do is also look at the fact that there is no diagnostic anger code and uh, anger disorder we think there should be. That anger really has some characteristics from the basic psychology of emotions, which really make it different from the other negative emotions and that those characteristics are things we really wanna consider uh, in working on uh, anger. That the cognitions or attitudes that uh, spark anger um, or elicit anger may be different and that we've been too quick to take the same type of cognitive attitudes that we think are, are been shown to be related to anxiety and depression and just challenge them and see what happens. Um, and uh, there's a whole issue about, you know, the relationship between anxiety, uh, depression and anger, because, you know, that was the, um, in my reading, one of the reasons I think anger has been downplayed in the uh, modern psychopathology, psychiatric literature is the two largest figures in the beginning of the 20th century in abnormal psychology would have to be Sigmund Freud and Neil Kraepelin, you know, Freud, the obviously reasons and Kraepelin because of his historic textbook of psychiatry and both of them and very close to each other, 1902, 1903, had written articles saying that anger was really part of depression and you wanted to the, treat the depression. So there is this relationship between anger and depression, which has dominated the field and I think kind of uh, done it harm because we don't really identify what this relationship may be. And uh, we're trying to look at some strategies and how they're related. And we've come up with about three different models that can account for how come people who are angry sometimes feel depressed and people who are depressed sometimes feel angry. Um, but that probably treating one doesn't resolve the other. In other words, if I treat your anger, it doesn't resolve your depression. And if I treat your depression, it doesn't resolve your anger. They tend to be comorbid for a number of different reasons. And the idea that treating one will resolve the other has been, I think, a, a big clinical mistake um, that we've made, okay? All right, so uh, I think I've droned on for a while and it may be time to uh, have a few people ask some questions. So I guess uh, Julia will, We'll talk about the questions. Yes, Can yes. Questions? Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, I think what was staggering is how everything you say produced a number of comments in the chat box, and it just shows how uh, topical it is and how people have their own positions, their own views uh, on anger, and how it is a topic which always produce, produces uh, reaction. I'll just answer one question, which is technical question, which was asked right in the very beginning about your uh, masterclass in March, whether it will be recorded. It will be recorded. We record all our events, but it won't be sold 
afterwards as a recording. So if you booked on the event, but for whatever reason couldn't come, you will get the recording. But if you hope to purchase it later on, that won't be available. So book for it and you will get a recording if you can't make it, or if you can only make it for half a day or, or for, for whatever period of time. So that's a quick answer to that question. And um, there were many comments, but I know Paul, Paul Grantham asked me to reserve a first spot for himself and I will, I'm going to allow it. So Paul, qu first question from you and then we'll go for questions from the audience. You're muted. Yeah, wow, where do I start? Um, I, I guess I'm going to limit myself to uh, just one particular question, which sort of covers to some degree some of the issues that have been raised by other folk, which is how, first of all, how we define or come to a conclusion that anger is pathological. <laughs> and you use that phrase, it doesn't work for you, or it doesn't work for me. And I, I just wonder if you could say a little bit about how that's, what that means really to say it's not working. And secondly, if you could say something very briefly about um, whether you see and in what context you see anger as being a positive force potentially. Right. So let me answer the last part. There's, I think anger, the problem is we lump together anger with a lot of other emotions. You know, um, in English, at least, uh, we, we, we don't have too many words that distinguish positive effective anger from negative anger. Whereas when I've done talks in Spanish speaking countries and I say there's a difference between a non-disturbed anger and a disturbed anger, the Spanish speakers get that right away. Oh, you mean this word or that word? So other languages have different words. Now we psychotherapists often use the word in rage. And I would say that only psychotherapists, I've never had a client say I experience rage. You know, only if they've been in long-term therapy will they use that term. So while there may be some English words in terms of vernacular usage, they're not identified. So um, if we look at the literature, there's loads of literature that says that the more you trade anger and the more your anger, the more negative things happen to you, the more likely you are to be involved in the criminal justice system, the more likely you are to, you know, lose um, relationships, the more likely you are to have difficult relationships with your children. You know, at one time I had a group of about eight guys four of which had children in their 20s and 30s that hadn't spoke to them in more than a decade. You know, um, that's really a negative consequence. So I think that that's it. And the problem with anger and the consequences, I think is the difference between short-term consequences and long-term consequences. So if I want to get my daughter to clean the sink when she's done cooking, which she doesn't do most days, right? I could go down there and say something nasty and sarcastic, and it will be effective in getting the sink clean, but she's not going to want to talk to me. So we have this difference between the short-term control consequences and the long-term quality of the relationship consequences and not sort of do them. So yes, I think it is a hard issue. I think that there are characteristics of an anger-like experience that are productive, but not very. And my favorite person to talk about in relating to this concept is Nelson Mandela. You know, Nelson Mandela says you could be, you know, have some arousal, but when you want revenge, you focus on the past and you keep the anger going. And if you look towards the future and how you're going to build relationships, then you know, you're motivated to change. So the, the temporal aspect of your sentences or self-talk may be the crucial aspect that determines whether your anger is productive or dysfunctional. And changing that, uh, the, the tense of the verb may be really important. Thank you. I think that question actually covered a lot of the discussion which was uh, going in the chat box. Um, there was a question very recently, which I wanted actually to put to you, Ray. Are there any societies where expressing anger is socially acceptable and maybe encouraged? What have you discovered in your research? I think that 
there are aspects of the of certain cultures. In other words, there may be within each of our, our societies subgroups where you the um, honor code is more predominant and that showing your anger is really important for your social status. So I think that that's very often related to social class um, and it's very often related to educational level. And the social psychologists who've looked at this anger code things have suggested that yes, this idea of being angry, looking for aggression, trying to get revenge, are related to a number of social psychological variables. And one of them is the degree to which you have police activity to suppress criminal behavior. Where there is no central police force, you have more an, uh, honor code, more expression of aggression. And um, at least studies in the United States, I really hate to say this, but the studies in the United States show that Americans from the South, uh, our South, and Americans of Irish and Scottish descendants have more honor code than other Americans. Now, I don't know of uh, studies that have done that in other countries, but we, we clearly can identify that to some, not necessarily cultural differences like the French versus the Finnish, but to within a society, there certainly are some cultural aspects that seem to influence that. Okay. Um, uh, there was a question which uh, you actually mentioned uh, the answer before we started today uh, about the pandemic and whether it makes people more angry and people who are normally reserved, are yeah. they expressing their anger more? I think so. I can just tell you that uh, my uh, anger group has been particularly troublesome uh, since Christmas. I think that there are background factors that sort of, you know, like we know now that people become more irritable and more easily prone to anger if they don't sleep, if they don't eat, if they have other kinds of pressures on them. So that the more your coping resources and your frustration tolerance is taxed, the more likely you are to prone into anger. And I have seen that. Now, in the last couple of weeks, it's been particularly prone here, not necessarily because of the pandemic, I think, but because of our January 6th uh, insurrection in Washington, D.C. You know, we have uh, people are much more irritable and much more quickly to, to respond to anger uh, in, in that situation. So I'm kind of uh, definitely see that environmental influences decrease your ability to ward off anger or increase your ability to get angry. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we are approaching our cutoff time of uh, 7, uh, 745. And I just wanted to say huge thank you to, to Ray for coming to talk to us uh, and giving his free time to talk to us uh, today. And just to say to you that I think what we've had today in a chat box and the number of questions and Ray's presentation just shows how this topic really needs exploration. And I just want to encourage you to come to uh, Ray's masterclass on 12th of March. Uh, and if you can't uh, be there, book the course and uh, watch the recording. And I really hope that uh, this is just the beginning of our relationship and our cooperation with Ray and we will invite him again to talk to us. Thank you very much and you can unmute yourself and say goodbye and wave and whatever. The Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for coming and see you again. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Some microphones are so clear. <laughs> you can yeah. uh, thank, you. Can thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Raymond. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Stay safe. It's a big group.
Yeah. It was a big group. It was 340 people at the top. And then I closed the room and didn't wow. talk to anybody later than 10 minutes. Because otherwise, all my attention is on the waiting room. Yes, I, I, know. Open, I know. I can't do anything just letting people in. So we do we do say to people in our email that the room will be closed after 10 minutes. So they should they should know. And how far do people come? We've got uh, I, will, I will have a look in the chat, but actually it's it's worldwide. You know, yes. when we've started this, uh, we had people from India, from Hong Kong. Paul today was running an event where people came from Australia and they oh, went wow. a whole day event with him. So they had to get up, I don't know, in the middle of the night. And uh, so, yes, it's in a strange way. This pandemic opened up the training to much wider audience. Because I think that makes it very interesting discussions because you can see how different concepts work in different cultures. It, I think that this pandemic and this uh, web-based format is going to give us more of a global psychology. Mm -hmm. It's going to change the way we think when, and check us to make sure our ideas aren't so uh, specific to our culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's very true. That's very true. And also, we can invite people like you, Ray, yeah. to yeah. come and talk to us, which is, which yeah. is great. <laughs> which is great. That's great. Lovely. Well, um, I'm going to close the room. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Thank you. Thanks very much Thank you. again, Ray. I'll okay. be in contact shortly. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thanks. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Take care. Take care, folks.